Okay. So thank you so much, um, everyone. Um, we're really excited um, to join. Um, I'm really excited to have join us tonight is Lois Pace, um, the direct executive director, president. Pre yeah. Yes, Executive Director, President, I'm sorry, of the Global Health Council. Um, and uh, I'm just going to sort of jump right in. Can, um, so uh, I know everyone in this room has um, been reading a little bit or a lot about the, the Global Health Council. Before I ask you um, about your career and how you got there, can you give your sort of the elevator pitch about what the Global Health Council is? Oh, yeah, sure. No problem. Thank you, by the way. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to you all for showing up to hear me say something tonight. I appreciate that. Um, they must have told you I was someone important. <laughs> but uh, the Global Health Council, we are a, an advocacy coalition based here in Washington, DC. Um, and we're essentially, some people like to call us lobbyists for good. I mean, we, we spend a lot of time just educating and advancing the interests of global health um, and a lot of organizations that work in that space. And so we have a number of members in our network like Save the Children or World Vision or organizations like that that you might have heard of. Um, and they do a lot of good in the world. And we feel like there need to be people here in Washington really promoting their work, you know, talking about all that good stuff and making sure that the US government in particular continues to support it. So that's my day to day job. Um, and so a lot of the work that you do is the, the, the education and the lobbying. I love that, the lobbying for good. I always feel like there should be different rules about being a lobbyist. Um, there's sort of a revolving door and that it should, it should behave differently if you're doing a, a, a good guy um, work. But uh, you've never in your career actually worked for the federal government. Um, and so, which is sort of an interesting that you, you're an expert of how to get things done in it without ever being an insider. Uh, I don't know about <laughs> being an expert, but uh, I guess it makes me both, um, you know, sort of exhausted by the whole process and also, uh, I guess, um, uh, sort of pleasantly naive about it, I guess. I, you know, I, I have this hope about government uh, that it can sort of solve certain problems that well, people you know, I'm actually search. thinking about you being exhausted, which is actually impossible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe if you ran an ultra marathon. Right. Um, but can you talk a little bit about your career and the, the, yeah. the things that you have done that have given you these skills that you need in order to or do the uh, incredible yeah, work? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, there aren't a lot of folks in Washington who work in policy who have done the work. And I've just come to understand that over time. I think I took for granted that it was sort of a an interesting um, characteristic or you know aspect of my resume or, or of my own journey. A lot of people show up in DC and they stay in DC and they wish they had sort of gone overseas or just done something else in their community. Um, I kind of did the reverse. I um, it's funny. I there used to be this book. I think it still exists. What color is your parachute? And I was um, cleaning out some things maybe a few years ago and looking back on having done all these surveys um, around the time I was graduating college. And it told me then that I should have been in Washington working in policy and I had no idea what that meant at the time. And I just ignored it thinking, no, I'm supposed to be a doctor, leave me alone, book. Um, so I, I pursued, uh, I tried to pursue a career in medicine that was not going to work out after I took chemistry. Uh, and so I ended up um, kind of falling into public health by way of education. So you know, left, left school and um, at the time I was graduating I don't even, I think Google was just starting up and I was going to school in Silicon Valley. So a lot of people were leaving and going to work for the tech industry. Other people were working in investment banking my, or consulting. My point is we didn't get degrees for what people were going to do. So it was sort of a confusing time. Um, and I ended up uh, choosing to teach. I had done some teaching in the summers prior and I enjoyed it and I was able to find a teaching position in um, sort of a combination of biology and medicine. I was able to do that overseas. And so it was just a really good fit and a really good place to land temporarily. And in retrospect, I find that that's important or that was important in my story because it taught me how to translate information um, and relay information to, to different audiences and connect with people in really important ways. And I've been able to tap into that, I think, throughout my career. Um, but after, after teaching for a bit, I ended up sort of Again, falling back into, into the health and wellness space. Um, I'm from the inner city in Los Angeles, and it was really important to me that I give back at home, and I started to do a lot of community outreach and awareness activities uh, in LA in particular, and, um, and sort of found myself really thriving in that, in that arena, really. And we can talk about sort of why health was so important to me, but you know, it really just came down to um, 
my equity lens. And for me, I could really see um, a path towards helping people realize equity um, through health and, and public health in particular. Um, but, you know, da 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 um, kept doing that for a bit. And I did that at home. I did that abroad. And eventually I found myself really frustrated with I guess, hitting a ceiling in the community health work. So I was working with really awesome people, a lot of people who were affected by um, uh, disease, different diseases and risk factors and, and were just really awesome individuals, but ultimately didn't have all the resources they needed to be successful. And to me, that boiled down to policy change um, and advocacy. So w once I started to do more community advocacy, it sort of led me back to Washington. And here I am, however many years later, um, doing this work, which is really rewarding. Um, I, you know, I think it's so interesting looking at that, the domestic um, global path um, that you've taken. Um, and so when you look at the issues that you, the, the, the advocacy work um, and the community-based work that you did in Los Angeles and compare it to sort of the, some sort of the 30,000 foot level advocacy work trying to get um, millions of dollars more for, for global health programs. How do you think those um, relate to each other? Um, and, and here, you, you know, speaking to your, your passion for health and, and how different those worlds are. Yeah, no, that's interesting, right? Um, I mean, one thing I have to keep in mind, well, one thing I hear a lot of folks say is, um, and a lot of, a main reason that we lose people, um, that people leave Washington, I should say, um, is because they miss that connection to people on the ground. They miss the field. And I, um, I don't necessarily have that craving to sort of um, go in and out of Washington. And I think it helps that I'm always able to keep people on the ground in my mind. Like whenever I'm walking to a congressional office, whenever I'm even talking about the work I do here, I'm thinking about the people with whom I I worked. I'm thinking about, you know, the women I would I would um, speak to in laundromats or beauty salons. I remember the men I would engage at churches and and fraternity houses. And so, I just I, that's that's the difference. Um, but also a very important um, bridge for me to build personally is be, is because you in Washington you can feel so far removed. You can sort of think in dollars and cents and not in terms of, you know, people and and lives, right? Um, and so I don't know if I'm answering your question that well, but to me that's a that's a very important distinction between, you know, sort of what, what happens here and I think a lot of times we lose sight of, you know, the real stories. No, I think I, I um, as someone who's who's worked in Washington DC and, and in the federal government, I think there are, are many times that I felt that that disconnect and, and know that is something that people struggle with. And I think that's as um, the leader of the preeminent advocacy umbrella organization, I think the fact that you retain that um, becomes is critically important. Um, and I guess a, another uh, question that I that I have is about um, sort of the priorities of um, peace, because if you're working with individuals on the ground, you can see what their priorities need to be. But if you're in Washington and you're trying to figure out what are those priorities that we're setting for large communities that we don't know, how how do you see, um, you know, how, how do you organize your own, you know, priority setting um, beyond the, you know, the, the dollars and cents? Yeah, I'll just add. Okay, so that's, that, yeah, <laughs> it's hard um, because we do serve many masters, as they say, at Global Health Council, um, and we cover everything from AIDS to Zika. That's just the reality. That's what people want us to do. Um, I do, I break it down in a couple of ways, which I think is helpful. Um, first off, I recognize that GHC as an organization, a small sort of secretariat for all these member groups, um, can't lead on everything. And so um, there are certain issues like with HIV AIDS, there is such a strong constituency that already exists. And we care very much about AIDS, obviously, and the end to AIDS. And we want to stand behind those advocates um, and support um, their work. We want to kind of be a part of that chorus. Um, and then there are other issues that um, have, you know, just been around a long time and just have continued to lack the attention and resources they deserve, like tuberculosis, I think is a good example. And so that community is robust in its own right, but still could do with uh, a group like Global Health Council shining a spotlight on them and kind of helping like uplift um, the work that they do and the messages they have. So that's a different sort of partnership role that we play. And then there are some areas 
that no one really owns because they're so big and it's kind of hard for us all to wrap our arms around. And I think an example of that could be something like this rallying cry for universal health coverage around the world. You know, there isn't like one group in our network that can really claim that space. And I think rightfully so, because it involves so many aspects of what they all do. Um, and I think GHG is positioned to kind of bring everyone together around these like huge themes, um, like health systems, like health financing, like health coverage and health access. Um, so that's how, it, that's one way that I prioritize our work. I think another way when it comes to the actual issues, like whether or not we focus on malaria or cancer, um, is a little bit harder. <laughs> it's actually a lot harder. Um, but I will say that one thing I, I try not to do is, um, just be driven by mm, like what's the disease du jour, right? Like what is like some, I have great respect for many of our elected officials and also um, they have special interests. Like that is a real thing here in this town. And I think it's our responsibility um, as advocates, as practitioners to educate them on what's truly needed and not just what they would like to see because they saw some documentary or they read it in an article or they have a person in their you know state who's really gung ho about um, about one thing or another so it it requires um, some courage and credibility on our part to really step out and say no actually this is this is we really appreciate your enthusiasm and um, this is the set of issues that we think you should focus on and that's informed by our network of 75 plus organizations who have been doing this collectively over hundreds of years in hundreds of countries with thousands of people on the ground. Um, I, yeah, no, sorry, no, that is such a good point about the, the because you, one of the issues you do want to address is the, um, the NTDs, um, and, but, but you don't want to do it ad hoc. Um, oh, thank you very much, John. Um, oh. I, I just one more question, then I'll, 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 oh, tur I'll turn great. to John. It's a great question. A lot of the, um, uh, I mean, universal health coverage, no, but the other disease you mentioned are infectious, infectious diseases. And we've talked a lot, um, sort of, you talk a lot in global health and the funding structures are really around infectious diseases and that's where, that's where the money is, it's where the pills are, um, it's where the know-how is. And, and I think it's a little bit easier of an argument of the, the why we care argument um, is, well, infectious diseases travel and then we can become infected here. I mean, the Ebola could come into the United States. Sure. Um, and, I th and I always feel like there's a, a harder argument for why we care about non-communicable diseases that don't pose um, the same um, sort of immediacy of risk, mm -hmm. or why should we care about addressing mental health issues overseas? So how does that, so how do you, what is the arguments that you make yeah. to get funding for um, those, those diseases, given, given the morbidity mortality we should mm -hmm. focus on it, but maybe that the national security risks mm -hmm. that, that motivate some of our elected officials aren't quite there? Well, we, we haven't been that successful yet, so I think if people have ideas, I'm open to them. Um, but um, it's, it's interesting because we, in my former role, um, when I was spending more time on the ground, certainly, um, I was a part of a group that uh, hosted a congressional delegation to East Africa. We went to Rwanda and Uganda, and we were trying to show them the the problem of cancer and other non-communicable diseases on the ground. And I remember, I mean, these are people who have worked on the Hill in very important positions, and um, and they were very surprised to hear that. I remember one person saying, oh, these aren't couch potato conditions. You know, you don't have people sort of just like eating McDonald's every day, and that's why they're getting sick. You have people who have strep, and that is untreated and then that becomes rheumatic heart disease later in life, you know, like that's really what we're seeing. Or we're seeing something like, you know, HPV being an issue. So the same risk that is involved with say HIV um, is, is um, serves as a risk factor for contracting something like HPV, but there's no vaccination, there's limited diagnosis and treatment. And so then you save this woman um, from, from AIDS only to have her, and even childbirth and other things um, related to our programs and investments, only to have her you know, die in her 30s or 40s from cervical cancer. Uh, and so that's, that has landed, you know, helping people understand that 
these types of diseases are present very differently in other parts of the world. And, you know, while there are certainly people who are affected by these conditions here in the States, um, they have cer a certain level of resources um, at a very basic level. You know, it doesn't cost a lot. I, I mean, it takes vinegar to diagnose or to at least like um, to, to, to see a, a cervical cancer lesion um, or precancerous lesions, excuse me. It, it, it's things like insulin and, and some heart disease meds are really pennies on the dollar. You know, they're generic meds. So you don't need like lots of machines and hospitals and things like that um, to address these issues. Um, and it, not to mention all of the prevention that's involved in, in sort of mitigating them in the first place. So I think that argument can go a long way. And I think also just, you know, there is something to be said for um, really finding solidarity with people around the world. And so it is interesting to me how in global health, we almost have this need to say, well, we only want to address the things that we don't deal with here. You know, like malaria, we don't get. TB, we do get here, but people don't associate that with, with the US. Um, HIV is similar. So it's like, yeah, that's stuff we should be doing. But heck, I mean, we have how many people know someone who's been affected by cancer or who's lost someone to cancer? I certainly have. And so it's really incredible to me that we don't make that connection and we don't just sort of lead with our hearts even just to say, well, gosh, I know what that feels like, you know, um, and I want to do whatever I can to support individuals around the world to in fighting this disease. I mean, I, I, that works for some people, not everyone. Um, but there's some, you know, other arguments too, obviously, that you and I, and we all have been uh, employing too, because you need tools in your toolbox beyond pulling on the heartstrings, right? You need to make the economic argument too. And the fact is a lot of people are dying in their productive life years of these chronic conditions. They're not, they're, we're not losing them as children, we're losing, the, losing them as as mothers and fathers or, you know, other other leaders in their communities. And and it's a loss for everyone that does have ripple effects around the world. I, I love that term, the toolbox for advocacy, which is needed. I'm going to turn to John. Oh, oh, oh. I guess I, I, well, as you're an incredibly effective advocate, I was struck by the last couple of minutes. You didn't go to Dick. Oh, is this, is this oh, yeah. working? We have to do the thingy. Oh, oh is the thingy not on? Oh, uh, oops. There we go. Oh, it's not on yet. Oh, I get it. I'll just. Uh, we have three microphones. I, we have three of these. <laughs> I think my question is about narratives. I thought it was really striking the way you told stories about individual people mm. and their lives. And, and, and so I think one of the most important things health professionals are going to need to do to advocate is to think about ways to do it. Data is obviously mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Impact is incredibly yeah. important. The kind of arguments you need to make to a legislature are yeah. very important. Mm -hmm. But why, why do you start with personal stories, and do you think that those narratives are the most effective way, or a, a particularly powerful way? To yeah, I think they can be. I mean, I'd like to think they can be. It's it works for me. I mean, I come from a tradition of storytelling, I guess, um, as well, and. Um, you know, maybe from my early years working in the field, you know, whether that was in, you know, the inner city or, or someplace abroad, it just, that that was just the starting point, you know? And in particular, when I worked in cancer, you, you someone always told his or her story, you know, his survivorship story. And I, I there's this quote, and I don't, I don't know who, um, whom to credit for it, but um, someone has said, I think, statistics are stories with the tears wiped away which I think is really powerful. You know, we think in terms of data and stats, but really, like, who's behind all of that? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really important to me that we lead with it. Um, it's, it's how I keep going, as I was saying before, too, so it's sort of selfish as well. Um, but yeah, I just think, you know, at, at our core, we're all people, you know, and like, I do believe in this common thread of humanity, and I do, really lean on, especially these days, um, opportun whatever opportunity I have to connect those dots, to build those bridges, so that, you know, before anyone has an, a chance to say, well, no, that's an other, you know, and kind of adopt this us versus them framework, it's like, no, 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 let me tell you about this child, you know, this mom. You know, one of the things I think that you all have done, especially under your leadership at rebuilding the global health concept, is to remind people of this, I mean, really this unique bipartisan coalition. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it still off? Oh, there it is. is it on now? Okay. Yeah, so it, this unique bipartisan coalition that, and 
And I guess looking ahead in this, the politics we're in now, just your thoughts, can the, do those stories connect? How do they connect everybody from the evangelical right to some of the most liberal activists, all of whom are members of your coalition? Um, and how do you, um, how, what, I guess just what's your, looking ahead, how optimistic are you that we can keep, that these stories and this way of thinking keep, can keep people together? Because, you know, our politics are getting harder, not easier. Um, yeah, so I am still hopeful, <laughs> somehow, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I am, I'm trying to think of, I, I want to offer concrete reasons why, um, I mean, look, not all of the things will work for all of the people, so I acknowledge that, um, and there are going to be some issues in some ways that we talk about issues that just won't fly with certain groups, um, but there's enough, you know, you think in these, like, overlapping circles, right, and there's enough, like, overlap there, I think, in global health in particular that, um, you know, enables people to to stay at the table, even if they're not kind of participating all the time. Um, I also, I don't know, there's, I think people want to have something that they can coalesce around, especially now. Like, it's really tough. <laughs> and there aren't a lot of things that we can show up um, on the Hill and offer that will unify folks. And so, in some of the conversations we have, I mean, it's just, I think it's sort of a relief for people from different sides of the aisle to feel like they can go have a productive conversation with their counterpart, you know? It's like, oh, thanks for bringing this, like, health system thing. That's something we can talk about. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that's that's one reason I'm hopeful is it about health kind of remaining in that bipartisan space because there, because it is dwindling the number of issues that kind of are you know, have that luxury. Um, I, I, that said, I do, I do know that a global health can suffer the same fate as a, as a number of other things. I mean, all the rules have been broken. You know, a lot of things used to be taboo in terms of like what would cause conflict. And so I, I don't think that, um, global health is entirely safe. And I, and it is one of the reasons why I want to be very careful about, how we talk about, for example, infectious diseases. And so one of the things, and I'm not pointing to you because you did that, but you reminded me of something I, um, because, um, you know, one thing that's been kind of hot and what people, what's resonated with a lot of elected officials has been global health security, right? So to, to your point, um, Ebola can go anywhere. And what that can become quickly and I think dangerously is keep those people out, build the things that keep those people out et cetera, and that becomes a very partisan debate as opposed to you know some of the other reasons why we want to fight Ebola. Like no one wants a pandemic, period. And um, it, you know it would be good to build health systems in other countries that we can sort of borrow from ourselves or leverage for ourselves or you know there's just there are different ways to talk about it that can kind of take us or that can either like take us more into that territory of like this us versus them or um, just be a little bit more, I don't know, balanced or diplomatic. But that's, I think that's the risk that we face in this environment. No, I think, I, I mean, language is so important. Um, and I think using the proper language or is great and using the wrong language can, you know, can shut down a conversation and can close a door. Um, I think there's a lot, um, just, just speaking about the, I mean, obviously you, came into this job um, in this administration, um, which was different than the job that perhaps you, the, or the environment you thought you were you were going to come into. But um, let, me, let me just be specific. I <laughs> was hired in October of 2016, and I started in December 2016. So somewhere in between those two events. Something happened. There was <laughs> something pretty significant that happened in the history Pups of our, won the World <laughs> Series. <laughs> exactly, that, exactly. That. That's exactly. Mainly that. <laughs> Sorry. So I think um, there's sort of been a, a, a debate and an ongoing conversation about advocacy, about whether or not this administration is th sort of the same. That if we look, we have a two-party system, and one you know one party believe works on and prioritizes certain things, and another party party prioritizes other health issues. And depending on who's in power, you know you have the global gag rule, you don't have the global gag rule, and it's. It's just the way that advocates, um, whether um, domestically or internationally, work. Um, and then on the other side, um, there's a conversation about whether 
this administration is actually doing things differently. Mm -hmm. um, and whether the challenge is if you are, um, if you want to do the things that you've, that you've sort of talked about are, are more challenging, um, let's say under a Republican Trump administration than a Republican Bush administration. And so can you just speak to sort of the pieces that you actually see as the same and, and, re and going back to that basic advocacy, advocacy toolkit and where you really, it is sort of a new, a new environment um, and the challenges are unique. Um. Um, honestly, the one constant is Congress. Uh, I mean, this administration has really changed the game across the board in policy and advocacy, including in global health. And um, and while um, we're pleased to work with um, both political and career staff um, that we have, who you know have stepped into roles with a certain level of expertise and energy, that's been really helpful. Um, but I think, in particular, when we look at the budget, which is you know due any day now, um, and and kind of what we've seen in pre previous years. Um, that's where they've really diverged from where we had been over the past, you know, 15 plus years with different administrations, both DNR, um, and so Congress has sort of reaffirmed our national commitment to these issues by pushing back in a bipartisan way against um, the the proposal for pretty severe cuts to these budgets um, for, for global health and foreign assistance, broadly speaking. Um, so that's, I guess that's what I see as like the, the major difference. Um, what's the same? <laughs> um, that's a little harder to answer. I did have an answer when you were talking, but I got so, I'm so like drawn by the differences now that I don't know if anything really comes back to mind. Um, but I, you know, I, there, I mean, look, even with all of the back and forth, you know, that we've had around, say, the budget, we still have a PEPFAR. I mean, we still have a State Department. Like, that's not said lightly. I mean, we, we still have, are showing some leadership at the UN and in other, in, at other sort of, in other circles. Um, so that's, you know, I, th I think we collectively as advocates are keen to, to see that leadership maintained. It's not just about the money, it's about our presence in the world and you know what we say is, is, is truly the key. Um, I think the other thing I was thinking actually was actually back on a difference though. Um, another really significant change um, that this administration has put into place despite sort of the back and forth that you just mentioned of the gag rule is obviously the expansion of what had been known as the Mexico City policy and just the fact that so that it's so sweeping now, and that it um, not only is affecting sort of the reproductive health community in those programs, but HIV and TB and other programs. And what's interesting about that is that it has brought the community together in different and somewhat surprising ways. And so now you have a um, kind of a pretty diverse constituency fighting for what historically had just been seen as a sexual reproductive health issue. Um, you have the HIV community saying, mm, this is not good for anyone, actually, because it affects access to ARVs. Um, so I think that that's, and, and I think overall what we're seeing, or what I've seen the past couple of years um, coming into this role, is actually the community, instead of going off into their corners um, out of fear of what's happening, really coming together because I just think, given all of the unknowns, there's people see value in, um, in kind of um, collaborating <laughs> and, if nothing else, holding hands and sort of jumping into the abyss together. Can I just, uh, one of the things that you're particularly well regarded for is your ability to keep people holding their hands together. No, no, no. I Listen, the, anybody that can get the whole global health community speaking with a single voice, that's no small achievement. But but I, I actually think that set of skill, we've been talking a lot about the external, like the, the voice of the community to the policy process. I, unless I'm mistaken, a big part of your job is with the various organizations. And that's a job that I think health advocates will need, whether it's global health or any other space. So I, I know it's not probably always the most fun part of your job, but if you could say a little bit about how you prioritize and your time to building and sustaining the coalitions, the relationships, 
how do you see your job as being, you know, is it a neutral broker or are you a leader or how do you decide when to play those roles? Yeah. Because yeah. that's a big part of making a difference. Yeah, that's my whole job. Um, it really is. I mean, this other stuff is just like, I go to the White House on the side. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and I actually, when people ask why I wanted this job, it's because I like herding cats, which is no one ever likes doing that stuff. Um, but I really enjoy the challenge of bringing people together in that way. Um, and I, I think... I know intuitively when to step in and step back. That it was really key, what you said. Um, sometimes I have to be more alpha. And I think now is some t well, now is one of those times, actually, because um, the community, I say that, you throw that around a lot. I'm sorry. I just mean like the people who've been working in global health forever and who do that work in Washington. Um, they, um, I think a lot of people have been really focused on putting out fires and defending our work. And what one thing I've been trying to push us to do and think about is, well, what happens when times change? I mean, the pendulum will swing back, even if it doesn't go all the way back to where it was. So what's going to be the agenda we put in front of a new leader? You know, someone who comes in and is really excited about this work and wants to, I don't know, double the State Department budget. Wouldn't that be crazy? Or, you know, just otherwise, like, really want to get behind this. So I have been through GHC, kind of pushing actors in our space to think more about not just a defensive strategy, but an offensive strategy. Um, that's one way I've tried to bring us together, and that is no easy feat at either. Um, and then I think back on this like topic of defense, even that, even deciding like, mm, I mean, it's all a negotiation, especially when you're talking about dollars and cents. So, you know, the president comes out with a budget that really slashes things, I think it's fair to say, by 30%. And then we, we don't know where Congress is going to fall on this. And we as advocates, you know, do we come through with, an, with another astronomical number on the other end of that? Do we try to sort of get closer to that cut but then still lose? And that was a really big negotiation. I don't think I have the time to tell you, like, how we went, how we went about that. But I can tell you the obvious things, um, you know, having built trust with the community and helping them understand that they are our priority after the people they're trying to serve were two really important factors in doing that. So it's like, look, you know, we believe in the work that you do is what I would be saying to our members. And so please do not mistake um, my request for compromise as a lack of confidence uh, in the work that you do. Um, I want that to be even more supported, and I want us to have a fighting chance at sustaining that. So, and honestly, a lot of people on the Hill would say we didn't compromise enough. You know, we we are still pushing as advocates, and that's something that the community helped me remember. You know, they're like, look, we're activists, we're advocates. Like, we're supposed to push the envelope. We don't always have to show up ready to, so, or we don't always have to behave, really, I think is what they were trying to say. Like, that's Congress's job to make that decision. They can figure out, like, how to bridge these two, like, vastly different figures, but we're going to come through with what our people need on the ground and, you know, they can either meet us where we need, where we are asking to be met or they can find some place in the middle, but we don't have to sort of do that job for them um, by coming too far um, back to kind of these pretty drastic cuts and what that entails. No, I think, I, well, I just think that coalition building is part of what public health advocacy is going to be going forward. And so sometimes that sounds really, oh, of course, you just get everyone in a room and we all agree. And that is so not, I think, the world you live in. Well, especially now, I mean, we've, we've, we're victims of our success in that we have spent a good, a good 15, if not 20 years, you know, kind of, um, solidifying these roles in like, I keep doing this because it's we, we call them verticals, right? So there's these very specific programs in which we have invested as an industry, really. We, we built entire industries around HIV. We built entire industries around immunization. And there was a good reason for that, you know, because the, the sort of more, I guess, like capacity building, like integrated model of the past wasn't necessarily yielding the results we needed. We weren't, you know, ending polio. We weren't ending AIDS. And so we had to focus in these other ways. But now everyone's pretty entrenched in those in those silos, you know, and they're 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 comfortable in those grooves. And so I do spend a lot of time saying yes and so it's not you have to now turn away from HIV to start working on universal health coverage. 
However, guess what? And people know this who work in HIV. You know, if you are investing in health systems in a different sort of way, you might be able to reach and should be able to reach that many more people um, that are harder to reach. You know, you're able to get, really get across that finish line because that's where all these diseases are now. We're we're not we're not really eradicating polio in tough places. You know, where there's still whether it's civil unrest or you know, um, mistrust of us, frankly, for, <laughs> um, and, and other issues. You know, we're not really reaching, um, like, teenage girls and men who have sex with men with important resources for HIV. Like, there's just, we're in that last mile, and I often argue that we're not able to actually make progress in that last mile unless we're finding common ground. And and that is that proves, that is proving to be true for people who work on this stuff every day. So again, coming back to the stories, like just ask people who do this work every day, they'll tell you what needs to be done and I'm just trying to listen. Uh, well, I was actually gonna sort of turn it to the to our stu students to ask some questions, but I feel like one of the key takeaways for those in the room who are going to a, um, a, a future in advocacy and global health is um, you need to have an expertise and a passion. Clearly, you have a lot of passion and a lot of energy, but also recognize that coalition building is is uh, extremely important to getting whatever you want done. You're not going to get it done by yourself, and you're not going to be able to do it in your silo in your community. And so, you know, even if you're going to be a fierce advocate, be a fierce advocate by building friendships. Exactly. You can do it well for a short time. Yes, but then. <laughs> So um, I'm going to turn to our student. I'm going to turn off my microphone. And, and um, could, sorry. Um, so when you when you can you please state your um, first and last name um, and then what you are studying before you ask your question. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Emily Mazur. I am studying biology of global health. I'm an undergraduate. Um, and thank you so much for being with, here with us today and talking with us. Um, but we talked about this a little bit. Uh, you mentioned the the struggles of connecting people on different ends of the political spectrum, especially. Um, I was wondering, with the diversity of the members of the Global Health Council, um, what advantages does that bring? So in contrast with the difficulties that you have, how does that help you um, advocate for global health? Um, I think it helps in a couple ways. I mean, having so many different issues at the table, you can kind of pick from a menu, and one of those will will kind of resonate with a member of Congress or someone in, in the administration. So I think that that's an advantage that we have. Um, and it's not just with regards to certain diseases, but even having um, corp the corporate sector under our umbrella. And that's somewhat controversial for people, you know, for us to have private sector members, um, and I can talk more about that later. But when we go in and have meetings with this administration, that really, that speaks to them in a different sort of way for us to go in with a Johnson & Johnson or an Eli Lilly or, you know, a Pfizer. Um, and, um, and yeah, so that's, that's what I would say is the advantage of having a diverse community is that we can really draw from their diverse experiences um, and, and kind of make different arguments to different audiences in a way that allows us to still ultimately reach the same goal. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Rachel Edwards. Uh, I'm also a biology of global health undergraduate here. And I have a question to touch on. You had mentioned um, health equity mm -hmm. sorry, <clears throat> earlier. And so my question is in the next, you know, the proposed budget cuts for a lot of the global health initiatives, do you see certain populations falling behind more drastically than others? Um, and what are ways because resources are so important to be able to achieve that equity, yeah. um, how are we going to be able to counteract that? Yeah, that's tough. Um, I think the most obvious one um, has been family planning. It's been a bit of a football. Um, Congress has done well to respond in their you know, pushback um, around that and even providing, I think it was the Senate that provided an increase um, in their version of the, of the last bill we saw. Um, and there isn't a great answer for that, honestly. Um, I, th I think that if those resources are significantly limited, we do see um, a dialing back of some of that work. There's there's not a great way around that. Um, we're not really in a position in these programs to plug all the holes that could be left by, by um, the US withdrawing uh, its commitment. 
that's a reality, and that's and that's what we try to translate. Um, now, um, or I should say, and also, <laughs> um, I think that what people in the in the city don't always realize too is um, kind of pulling one thing away from say family planning. We'll stay there. Um, we'll still have an impact in some of these other areas, um, and and so it's you know it has like this this really disturbing domino effect um, if if that's something that's realized. And it, it's partly because we have done a better job in the global health community to on the ground like integrating these programs and integrating this work. It's particular if we're about to transition it to countries themselves to own. I mean they are providing health services, period. And whether or not they're for nutrition or for immunization or for or water and sanitation, they, it's more holistic, I think, when done well and when done right. Um, and so to just kind of like, I, I think about like pulling a thread on a sweater, it can just really unravel rather quickly. Um, so that's that's one of our great fears, honestly, uh, is that we, you know, I know that it seems like we ask for a lot in global health, but it is literally a drop in the bucket in our budget. And... Um, and we frankly know that we could use more um, to, to get a lot of this work done. So we're, we're kind of already doing a lot with the little and I don't think there's a lot of meat to scrape off that bone. Sorry, that was a very dire response. Hello, I'm Jonathan Klazinski. I'm a global health major in the School of Foreign Service. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, so it is, uh, what do, uh, role do you think the private sector needs to play to achieve developmental goals, and how, as advocates, uh, can we incentivize, facilitate, and coordinate the activity of the private sector towards these goals? Okay, great. So, because <laughs> I'm the authority, right? Um, um, their role, uh, I do think, in light of a lot of the question marks we have around public funding, you know, the U not just the U.S. either. I mean, a lot of countries are. We watch the news. We know what's happening around the world. There are a lot of like, there are a lot of questions around where all of these Western nations will be in this space and. 10 years, if not the next five. Um, so there is an opportunity for the private sector to step into um, this space in a different way. Th I know that they definitely don't want to be on the hook for everything. Um, they have said that pretty clearly. Uh, but they're, we don't have a lack of money in this world. I mean, that's the reality, right? It's just a matter of unlocking it. So I do think that that is, to, the, to answer your next question, um, that's our job as advocates, to make the case for these companies who still aren't in the game. And that could that's not all like Fortune 100 or 500 companies either, right? Like those are small and medium enterprises that are, you know, exist at the regional or even national level. Um, so I'm talking about sort of local advocates or in-country advocates pushing on that private sector um, to, to contribute more. There are high net worth individuals. I mean, all the kids I went to school with, half of them are making a lot more money than I am. So, you know, what can we do to mobilize those resources is a question that I often have because there there is more money to be had, we all know. And so I don't I don't know exactly how to do it. Again, if anyone has an answer to that question, come talk to me. You can actually have my job. It's fine. Um, but I think that that, that is I, – I don't want to suggest the private sector will save us because I think that is not smart to think. But I, there is a way for us to take this moment – take advantage of this moment to diversify our resources. And that is, I think, one um, area that is open or provides an opportunity for us to do that. Mm -hmm. Can I just um, one follow-up question on that? When, when I think of the private sector, I think both of um, you know drug companies or medical device companies making some sort of product that then they could sell in the developing world and the middle class. And, and I also think of the work that they do on corporate social responsibility. And, and, and those seem like two different pieces. One is, you know, what are the opportunities that, because there is lots of money in the world and there's, as, as development is successful, there's more money in the world. Um, and so there's just a, a role to open up markets. And then there's a role that, as large multinational corporations, to, to give back. And so I just want you to speak to those, how, how do you when, you, when you were talking about engaging the private sector, which of those do you really, do you, 
do you engage with? I think it's all the above. I, I, I think that it's important for us as advocates to understand that, well, we all have many faces, honestly. I mean, even organizations in Washington, like, they have a bottom line that they're watching, too. It's for the right reasons, we can argue. But, you know, they're thinking in the same way. They're thinking about, like, what they can gain um, in that regard. So they can do more. Um, so, yeah, I think – I don't think it – gets us very far to only think, and I don't think you were suggesting this at all, but I think a lot of us in this like NGO sector, um, which is why I've lived a lot of my career, um, only think about like foundations and CSR and all of that, which is great. But like that's often a really tiny aspect of what these companies do. That's there's like one person who does this stuff at a lot of these places. And I don't I don't know how they do it, but they manage to get it done. Um, and so there are a lot of other people in these companies who are really interested in markets and you know it can I get it it can feel uncomfortable to talk about the our work in this way um know that people are talking about our work in this way and I think that it's my responsibility to think about how to speak both languages mm -hmm. um and both you know talk about sort of doing good and giving back and all of that and meet them where they are in terms of what their needs you know wh what 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 they feel they need to do or what their incentives are in terms of like getting pro pushing product out the door now is it my job to like make them wealthier than they are no 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 no. that's not what i'm talking about um but it's understanding that that is one of their goals and frankly pushing them to do that responsibly like there's more opportunity almost in like making sure that they're not just going and willy-nilly and not having their products be informed by people on the ground um not uh, charging out the, you know, sort of astronomical prices um, uh, of people who, you know, don't have the ability to pay. Like, all of these things, I think, are important engagement opportunities for civil society to hold the private sector accountable. Because it's because that is going to have much a much greater impact than anything we can do on the CSR side. And they know that themselves. And I, and I will have the same conversation with folks in the private sector to say, you got to be honest with yourselves, too. And, you know, not hide the fact that you have these dual objectives, you know. So come to the table with all of your agendas showing, and I'll do the same. And we can, we can, we can sort of identify where we come together and where we, where we don't. I think that's important. You will not be able to work with everyone on everything in the same way. And so, and that's the reality too, right? But, like, where we do come together, we can, we can do some real good. Um, and I think that that's a sweet spot in a lot of ways for even beyond global health, frankly. Um, you be the uh, <laughs> pass the mic around bit for the open. So any you want to open it up? Any other questions? <laughs> okay. So, okay. Hi, my name is Talia Zimmerman, and I'm also a biology of global health major. And my question for you is, what are some of the strategies that you employ to garner support around public health issues that are either highly politicized or really stigmatized in our society? Um, I'm trying to give other examples other than family planning. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I can offer more than what I've shared already around telling the story. Um, I think finding different messengers that um, to whom people can relate is important. So it's not just telling any old story, but um, I think we saw it with Ebola to some extent, right? You you had American sort of healthcare workers be affected by it. Um, so that's something, you know, a starting point as opposed to showing, unfortunately, the hundreds of Liberians or other West Africans who have been affected um, at the time. Um, I'm thinking about it too. I mean, the, the the controversy is real, and I don't I don't know if we need to spend a ton of time trying to convert people to. I think that that's also an important aspect of advocacy. You have to know how far away someone really is, and um, assess whether or not he or she's on the fence. And in, in that, you know, if that's the case, then we can you know have a chat about something like the family planning and help them understand that it's not just, you know, this strange way of trying to like, it's actually providing opportunities to women and families and communities, you know, and that, that resonates with people who are kind of still on the fence about certain things. Um, but some folks you won't reach too. And I think that that's an example of that, 
that um, when I was saying like you identify areas where you can work together and areas where like that are just sort of third rails, that that happens sometimes. It's woman in the glasses. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Margaret Chappell, and I'm also studying global health in the School of Foreign Service. I'm curious, you know, as you're advocating for U.S. investment in global health, how effective do you consider, you know, once you have those investments, how um, effective do you consider that spending to actually be? Um, for instance, I've had some professors who've kind of highlighted the limits of kind of the USA, like, three- to five-year project cycle. I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> How much waste is there in this? You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> um, there is, I, well, hmm, where do I start? <laughs> um, we've made a lot of improvement. Yeah, we've made, yeah, we've made a lot. There are, there are a lot of efficiencies. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> um, yes, there's still room for improvement for sure. Um, I do think that um, we have had to be careful suggesting, especially in this climate, that we can continue to do more with less or much more with much less because there isn't a ton, like, yes, we can still improve, but there isn't like, there's not like we've left that much on the table still um, by some people's estimations. I mean, I'm sure there's some like, everyone has a different interpretation of that, um, but it's not, the problem is not just with the community being inefficient with its spending. Does that make sense? Okay, great. And that's not an excuse. I think that's just a reality. Now, what I will say, um, very carefully, is um, I do think that is it is completely fair to be critical of the global, global health architecture. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that this moment presents yet another opportunity for us to look very closely at said architecture or infrastructure. Um, I think that um, a lot of what we're challenged by is not solely based on politics or the political environment. And we could have been thinking more um, deliberately um, and intentionally about, for example, integrated programs and um, leveraging resources before being in this position of under, like being under threat of losing all those. Um, and um, we're kind of catching up. I mean, even under the past administration, funding was flat. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, I think, tried to sort of solve for that, but could have maybe even been more creative in that, in that environment too. And so it, it's going to take all the things um, to right size this work. I mean, uh, a, a lot of folks will argue, and I think rightfully so, that this work needs to be increasingly owned by people on the ground and led by people on the ground. And you can't have all these like Americans or Canadians or Brits showing up and like doing all this stuff. I think now that we have this infrastructure, though, it's more than a notion just to say, like, okay, just. Give it, you know, like, let's just totally give all the grants to, you know, I don't know, X organization on the ground, which isn't even, they will even say, oh my gosh, we don't know, we're not prepared to deal with all that you have guys have set up, um, as flawed as it is. Um, and so there needs to be some thoughtful transition um, on this sort of journey to self-reliance, as, as Ambassador Green has said at, at USAID, and I think he acknowledges that too. Um, but yeah, if we're being honest as a community, we can continue to get better at our jobs. And I think there are a lot of people, even if they don't say so publicly, who are really thinking about how they can do that. I think w without criticizing anything, if someone, no one, if given a blank slate, would create the structure as it is now. Yeah. So there is, there's that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Allie Ross, and I'm in the global health program here at Georgetown. Um, so I was wondering, we've seen a lot with development aid that um, the US and the Trump administration specifically responds to what China does in kind of a tit-for-tat way. 
Um, so like increases development assistance in, in response to like one belt, one road. Do you see a path for like getting more global health funding that way? Or do you think it's something that's unique to like in infrastructure building? I, I do see a path. I will say um, that the, we've already, well, I don't know about money, but people noticed um, China's uh, increased engagement with WHO. People in this town noticed that. And it was really interesting to hear the chatter about it. Um, so, um, so yeah, there's some inroads there again it's one of those things though where it's like is that where we want to be you know um and so it's certainly not all that we want to be doing but i do think it's something we need to be paying attention to and you know continue to talk speak about right um um it, it's also somewhat related to this question is this like aid for votes um so looking at the un and like if you you know do things we want you to do then we you know, we'll think about funding you. And I think that is, I mean, yeah, that is a dangerous game to be playing. And that's certainly not where we want to be and what we need to be promoting. So it's like there's a line to some of this stuff um, in terms of kind of how much we want to leverage um, some of this political environment, for sure. But it's it's a smart question. This woman in Fuchsia has been, yeah. Hi, I'm Madeline Cuny, and I'm a biology of global health major and under, undergraduate at Georgetown. Um, my question is how you mentioned that you don't have any professional experience within the federal government. How have you learned to navigate your role? Mm -hmm. And are there certain things that you found really helpful in learning how to do that? Yes. yes. Um, I paid attention to other people. So I, I stumbled into policy because I was based in DC working I was based in DC running programs in like 12 countries. Um, so like working in Asia and Africa. But in my free time, uh, I would go to events. I would go to CSIS and Center for Global Development. And I was just sort of fascinated. And I would raise my hand as this really naive, like, I mean, the people people remember me. And they're just like, oh, she's so cute. She just, she doesn't know anything. Um, but, um, but it really was valuable to me just to sort of like be a sponge in this town. Um, I also, um, I remember I did take, oh, I shouldn't, I mean, it's not a Georgetown course, but it's like an, um, you know, those Capitol Hill series. It's like you can learn everything about like appropriations and the federal, but yeah, they're really cool and they're really cheap. So, or affordable, <laughs> like a couple hundred bucks. It's like the Congress, the, the yes. Congressional Foundation. Yes, 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 exactly. They'll tell you all about it. I found that very helpful. It's less expensive than going to Georgetown. Yes, absolutely. As someone who got into Georgetown <laughs> and did not come. <laughs> Um, so yeah, and there was one other thought I had about that too. Um, but I think, um, I think maybe the other thought I had was asking for help. I mean, you're not going to know all the things and that's fine too. Right. Uh, and just like people, you know, once they realize I have experience on the ground, it's like they tap me for that knowledge too. So yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a barter town too. So you have a lot of like lunches or coffees, coffee dates and learn a lot that way. You have a lot of members, though, who also have staff who've been experienced in government as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Including my own. Danielle, who's not here, has been doing this for 20 plus years. We're going to come to this side. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Cecilia Madsen. I'm actually a Master of Public Health student at Cornell. Um, trying to be a sponge in DC when I found this mm -hmm. seminar. Um, my question kind of builds on the question that you had earlier about non-communicable diseases and global health funding being used for that. And you talked about cancer, but I'm wondering more about um, like food system related diseases like diabetes yeah. or obesity. Um, where do you see funding going for there or is there a place in the future? Yeah, I, I worked on this issue for a long time actually. Not um, obesity or, or diabetes specifically, but this area of NCDs. Um, and so I've seen the swell of interest in this space. Um, and that's why people would really look at me quizzically when I would come to these things in Washington, because no one was talking about cancer and diabetes however long ago that was. Oh my gosh, that was a long time ago. Um, so yeah, no one was talking about it then. <laughs> I mean, it used to be that USAID would fund tobacco farmers as an economic development strategy, because that made sense, right? Like. That's what they did, and yeah, that's what they did, <laughs> and then they realized that's probably something they shouldn't be doing. Um, so the money hasn't come uh, is a sort of 
short answer to that question, um, even though the interest in energy has arrived. And I do think it's based on a lot of fear that we're talking about like dialysis machines and not just insulin. So in my former role, we just tried to really communicate kind of more uh, the steps toward um, investments and access. And that, again, it's not building these grand hospitals and providing all this care that even we don't have here, I would hear sometimes on the Hill, but it's making sure that at a basic level, people had access to prevention and to the extent they needed treatment. I mean, I, I lost a mother-in-law in West Africa to diabetes and it was very upsetting to me because she just, you know, it, it wouldn't have taken much for her to for her to be here today. Um, and so, um, so yeah, helping people understand um, kind of the small things that can be done and but really make a big difference is important. Um, but I think that comes back to just since you mentioned the sort of food systems, um, the importance of the private sector too and holding them accountable or, you know, coming to them with partnership opportunities. And you, you've seen companies really try and do this, you know, the, the former head of Pepsi really trying to step in and say, is there another business model for us aside from, you know, sugary, salty snacks and beverages. And um, we can talk about how successful she was in doing that. I think it's a hard job. Um, but that's, you know, more and more companies are even just recognizing that that's a smart way to go. And like, it's not just the right thing to do, but it, it can help your bottom line too. If you, if you have that support from stakeholders and that kind of staying power. I mean, just a, the one thing about the, the NCDs is, and, and you said this before, on um, that the diseases that we work on the, are the diseases that we're not experiencing here and so when we think about USAID we think of it as a or it is a development agency and so NCDs is not for developing countries they're for middle-income countries who have who progress to another stage and and I think that and part of that is a, sort of an ignorance about what it means NCDs is not about dialysis so you have some other examples Got it. yeah very thank you to echo some of my classmates and thanking you again you um, just for being here with us tonight. Um, my name is Armel Dejoie and I'm an undergraduate studying biology of global health. And my question kind of goes back to um, Professor McKean's um, question about why we should care about NCDs in developing countries. And I think that kind of goes back to the chari charitable nature of America and how we always feel like we kind of have to be the ones who give a lot. And I just, so my question is, um, how do we prevent that relationship from being just a charitable relationship? I think last last week with Dr. Fauci, we um, talked about building partnerships and not just these kind of charitable, um, one-sided relationships. So how does um, your organization kind of keep your partners and your shareholders um, accountable in that sense? I forgot I had to follow Dr. Fauci. <laughs> <laughs> He's fun. Um, so, mm, well, we've been talking about a three-legged stool, a lot of us, the past couple of years. So there's, uh, um, there's morality, um, and, and the, but then also there's economy um, and the importance of that. And so, and that's not just with companies. I mean, there's just, there are a lot of people who are interested in economic development and, you know, coming back to non-communicable diseases, for example, you know, the, the trillions of dollars that are, that we would lose in productivity and, you know, treatment and whatnot if we don't fight against those things. Um, and then there's also this kind of stability piece. Um, so, and this, I guess, is one of the reasons why I, I believe so much in health, because, you know, people get sick and, and people get desperate. Uh, and, and, you know, we can't blame health for everything, but there are a lot of, um, of crises that we can, I shouldn't say trace back to health issues, but like have linkages to, um, um, to, to health issues and health crises, you know, an outbreak here, or, you know, um, uh, you know, a lack of, um, acceptance of vaccine programs there. And so, um, 
so all of those arguments we are able to use or we, we encourage our constituents to use and not just sort of to be charitable, to be you know honorable, which is an important value, American value. But I do think that economic development is something that we believe in. I mean, we're a capitalist country for, you know, no matter what you believe we should be doing. <laughs> um, and we're a democratic country too. Um, and, and so there's there's ways we can talk about how health links to those types of goals um, and, and that helps build our constituency. Does that answer your question? And there is a woman in the back that we. Hi, I'm Amy. Uh, thank you for coming to this event. Um, and I was really interested in what you were saying earlier about storytelling and pulling heartstrings. Um, I'm a biology of global health major, but I. I'm really interested in um, bioethics, and I'm an English minor also, so I'm interested in that mm -hmm. side of health mm -hmm. um, communications. And so I think from my experience of reading the news and some internship things, um, I noticed that some messaging and like even photos or stories get told again and again, and people feel fatigue or it just loses effect effectiveness eventually. So. I'm wondering how do you see that problem being addressed and how do we like reinv reinvigorate people to be interested in something that we should be interested in? Yeah, yeah. Um, that, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, I agree that that is a fundamental issue. Um, so I think, um, you know, we can say, okay, the challenge of global health today is threefold. Um, there's this like growing or persistent burden of disease, which is sort of the nature of, of things. Um, there is um, uh, sort of waning leadership. Um, and there's also relatedly um, a dwindling of resources. But what's causing, you know, maybe two out of three of those things, I think it's a lack of inspiration. And I, and I do think it's important for us to recognize that. And when you, what you said about revitalizing um, our agenda and our narrative, that is absolutely something that um, we have been saying at Global Health Council is, is required. And, what we, and it's something we've been trying to help the community um, revisit. And I would say we aren't necessarily the right people, right? Like we are, we're all the same people who've been doing this for however many years. And so we need more and more um, newcomers to, to enter this space and to tell us what we're missing. Um, I don't think it changes with us. Um, the story doesn't change with us. It changes with the Silicon Valley entrepreneur or the person who works in fragile states um, or, you know, the, the Intel person. Like the, So we think about, like, medical device companies and pharmaceutical companies, but like there's a woman at Intel like changing the game, you know, just by like making sure that they're, <laughs> you know, we, we can manage data around like these outbreaks. Um, so those are the people I think that can per make a compelling case for global health and even think of sort of what's next. I mean, we, you gotta, you gotta realize too, we don't have anything that, you know, when I go to the Hill, we're still talking about PEPFAR. You know, we're still, and it's great. It's a great program. Don't get me wrong. I'm being recorded. It's great. Um, but what else, you know, like that's, it's not, and a lot of those people who are around for the birth of that program, they're gone, they're, they're gone or they're leaving. And, you know, this new generation of political leaders and potential champions, they need something else to, um, to get behind and we need to give it to them and we haven't yet. So that's a, a big challenge for us moving forward for sure. With, I mean, if there's no other questions, that I think actually that is a great, that's um, a great way to a way to end. Um, that we that this is the next generation that's going to sort of bring us together with the next challenges. And we're well, going to have one more sure. question. Yeah, it better be. <laughs> then, Sorry. And then, and then um, <laughs> hi, I'm Matthew Shacklin. I'm on the Global Health Program here. Also, um, it's the question is kind of similar to what you just mentioned. So, with the newly elected Congress, with a lot of younger generation that maybe weren't around for the creation of PEPFOR or other inspirational 
long-term global health programs. Mm -hmm. You kind of mentioned that they need something else to be inspired on. Yeah. So do you think that that's what's going to be needed for the next step in global health to engage these new members of Congress? Or like, do you see their lack of, they weren't there for the creation. So do you see these programs being threatened and maybe resources going to new programs? And like, I'm okay, you're nodding. Consolidation, I don't know. Can you just expand on yes, what you see I can coming? You mean, you can answer for me, it's fine. You're doing great. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, there are a lot of new people coming in and um, and everyone is trying to get at them too, right? right. Uh, so that's another thing we face. And so, so yeah, it's not a given. And it's it's funny because it's there's, there's sort of this blue wave, I guess people were calling it. and. We should not expect just because people identify as progressive that they're going to get behind this stuff. I mean, there is a lot of stuff at home that they care about that they ran on. And so um, I think that not only should we show up and talk about why this is so great and important, but we need to connect the dots to what we know they care about. And I do think that's the next phase in global health. And I do hear more people of, I don't want to say of your generation. That sounds so... <laughs> cliche, um, people who are not me, like you, <laughs> talking about things in this way. And I mean, again, I started, we started by talking about my experience at home. You know, I didn't start by talking about, you know, me being in northern Nigeria or Manila or wherever. I mean, I've been all over the world, but what drew me to this space was the work I did here, actually. And you, I mean, you're in Washington, D.C. You want to see the HIV rates here? You want to see the maternal mortality rates here? Like, that's, that's a story we really need to be telling, and that's a different way of talking about the work that we do, that, you know, because the worlds have been so far apart between, like, what we do in the U.S. and what we do, you know, abroad, and, oh, by the way, the U.S. is part of the globe, so why we don't talk about the U.S. and global health is very strange. But I think there's an equity agenda to be put in front of people. I, do, I think there is, you know, a way to, to, like, sort of bridge the global and the local that can really... You know, I want to say AOC will show up, you know, next week in class. That would be great. Um, but I do think, I mean, just for her energy, I'm bipartisan. It's fine. Um, but um, but I do think there's something to be said for, um, for yeah, like really um, finding these new allies. And that's come up a lot in our conversation. Um, but specifically thinking about um, connections to what we know and what these new champions really um really already are, are, are putting their energy behind. Can we end it there? Oh, sorry, you want to no, say something? No, no, thank you. <laughs> no, I, I just want to say thank you for joining us. This is exactly the kind of discussion we were hoping to have and to get your perspective on how people can make the argument for global health. So, Maeve, do you want to have the final word? My, my, my final word is that you should all subscribe to the Global Health Council website newsletter. Exactly. Um, because even though there's great global events happening at Georgetown, which were great that you've attended. The Global Health Council really pulls together all the events that are happening in Washington, D.C., at CSIS, and Center for Global Development, and other places. Um, and so subscribe to their newsletter. Exactly. It's a great resource. So, <laughs> And thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank again. you again. So I'm about a round of applause for our... <laughs>